Good evening. We are so pleased to be partnering with the Grand Rapids Area Library and to have all of you joining us for this event in the Moving Words Writers Across Minnesota virtual series featuring the talents of Brian Ferry, Linda Lagarde Grover, Sean Otto, and Sun Young Shin. I'm Wendy Worden, Programs and Services Assistant at the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, which is the Library of Congress Minnesota Center for the Book. As we get started today, we would like to acknowledge the Dakota people, indigenous keepers of the land from which we broadcast. This land was reserved by the Dakota in the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux signed with the United States in 1851, and it remains sacred to them today. I also want to acknowledge the Ojibwe people, fellow indigenous inhabitants of this land. Dakota and Ojibwe people are the original stewards of stories in this place now called Minnesota, and we at the Friends honor that tradition and the knowledge and values embedded in it as we work to lift up storytellers in our state today. The Friends has coordinated the year-long Minnesota Book Awards program for 14 years, and as Minnesota's Center for the Book, we produce programming that benefits all ages and reaches all corners of the state. This programming is supported by funding for the Center for the Book included in Minnesota's K-12 Education Bill. We are grateful to all the state representatives and senators who advocated for that funding. On to our main event. This series is made possible in part by the state of Minnesota through a grant to the Minnesota Department of Education and additional support is provided by the Harlan Boss Foundation for the Arts and Education Minnesota. We will have reading and conversation followed by a Q&A with you, our audience. Thanks for being here with us tonight. Biographies of each panelist will be posted in the chat along with their websites and we'll be following up this program with a brief survey to get your feedback. We have partnered with Next Chapter Bookseller in St. Paul to purchase books from our featured authors, so please visit their website or your favorite local bookseller to purchase books. We'll put links in the chat throughout the program. Please feel free also to put your questions into the chat all throughout and I will relay them to our featured authors. To start things off, we'll have a brief reading and presentation from each author. First, I'd like to welcome to Time Minnesota Book Award winner, Brian Ferry, who writes chapter books for kids. Brian, welcome. Thank you, Wendy. I'm really happy to be here. And thank you to everybody who's joining us tonight. I am very thankful to the friends of the St. Paul Library for inviting me to do this. Uh, tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I am lucky enough to have been a two-time winner of the Minnesota Book Award. Uh, the most recent was for this book, The Secret of Dreadwillow Cars, which is a middle grade book. So typically that means it's for ages eight to 12. Uh, it's a fantasy story. It's about a princess who is about to become the queen of where she lives uh, because her mother, the queen is dying. And so she has to learn how to be a queen. Um, the number one question I get asked when uh, I'm doing events, people say, well, why, why do you write for kids? Um, the more insulting way of asking that is, oh, when are you gonna write for adults? That's not even funny. Um, I love writing for kids, I really do. Uh, they're an incredible audience. Uh, and what I love most about kids is how inquisitive they are. Um, the Secret of Dread Rule of Cars is a book about asking questions. And, uh, I wrote it specifically because I wanted kids to know it's okay to ask questions. It's important to ask questions. Um, normally I would read from that book tonight, um, but I thought I'd do something a little different tonight. Um, just as, I don't know, a little treat, a little peek behind the curtains. I thought I'd read something from uh, what's going to be my next book. It will be out, I think fall of next year, possibly spring of the year after that. Um, it's another middle grade book, so we're talking ages 8 to 12, another fantasy. Um, and I just thought I'd give you a taste of, of what's to come. Uh, I don't have an exact release date yet. The title of the book is The Counterclockwise Heart. And I just want to read a little bit from the first chapter. I'm going to read and I'll skip ahead a little bit. Um, so the first chapter begins like this. Chapter 1, The Boy Who Talked to Stone. It was the coldest winter morning ever on record in the empire of Rheinveld when the people of Somber End awoke 
to find the onyx maiden in their tiny village. The night before, they'd gone to bed, fireplaces blazing to ward off the bitter chill, safe in the knowledge that a statue of Rudolf Emmerich stood over watch the center of their village. Emmerich, Somber End's long deceased first burgermeister, was a beloved figure in the town's history, even to that very day. So you can imagine the distress when dawn broke and the shivering residents scurried across the roundel in the village center on their way to work, only to find chunks of Emmerich's statue everywhere, a hand here, a kneecap there. Clearly, there would be no repairing the venerated idol, as much of its considerable girth had been ground into dark gray powder. Where Rudolf Emmerich had once stood, gazing wistfully over the town he'd helped settle, something far less reassuring now held reign. As tall as a two-story house, a maiden made entirely of rough dappled onyx loomed over the roundel. Adorned in armor, she appeared to be in the midst of a battle. Her right arm was thrown back, ready to strike with a cat of nine tails covered in rocky spikes. Her wild hair blowing in an unseen gale reached out in all directions like a demonic compass rose. Most terrifying of all was her face, frozen in a permanent angry scream. Who could have done this? Some villagers murmured. The empire's most contentious neighbors, the mysterious denizens of the hinterlands, were unlikely culprits. No one had ever seen these creatures. They were, again, mysterious. But the feral howls that rang out from the barren landscape to the west didn't come from anyone who might deliver an arguably symbolic statue. How could it just appear, others asked. If the statue was the height of a house, it must have weighed twice as much. Moving it would have been tricky at best. Few ventured theories because the most obvious answer, given the fate of the Emmerich statue, was the maiden had simply fallen from the sky. Still, other villagers asked a far wiser question. Why did this happen? These were the people who understood that who's and how's didn't amount, amount to nearly as much important as why's. When the rulers of Rheinveld received news of the maiden's mysterious appearance, they sent emissaries throughout the land seeking answers. Master scholars pored over ancient tomes but found nothing. The Hierophants, keepers of the mystical and arcane knowledge, had recently fled Rheinveld, it was rumored, afraid to speak the terrible truths they knew. Soothsayers far and wide cast bones and consulted the ether. They all offered the same dire warning. One day, the maiden would waken and bring a terrible reckoning, not just a somber end, but all throughout the empire. The chapter continues. We find that terrible things are happening to the village. Crops refuse to grow. Cows are giving sour milk. There are always terrible storms. People move away from the town because they think somber and is cursed. And then one day, a boy named Guntram begins speaking to the statue. Each day as the sun rose, Guntram would come to the roundel, sit cross-legged at the st statue's base, and talk. He would tell the maiden the history of Somber End. He would invent stories of ferocious warriors and fantastic creatures. At night before bed, he told her his fears and dreams and hopes. He confessed how he hated his family's meager existence and how he longed to live in a castle with more money than he'd ever need. He ended each night by touching the base of the statue and promising, I'll be back tomorrow. And then, after a week of this, a curious thing happened. The crops started to grow again. The cows became bountiful. Storms turned to gentle rain. Traders who'd avoided the village returned to do business. Life became what it had once been under the watchful eye of the Emmerich statue. In fact, life became better. No one knew how the boy had changed things. The more Guntram wove his stories, the more prosperous the town seemed to grow. The villagers soon called Guntram their guardian. Before long, people were coming from the farthest reaches of Rheinbelt to see the grotesque statue and the boy who had tamed misfortune with his imagination. Time passed and the poor unassuming boy grew into a tall forthright man. After a decade spent each day talking to the onyx maiden, calming her imagined rage with stories and songs. 
Guntram drew the attention of the Empress. The creatures in the hinterlands had been growing more restless every day. Needing a wise and brave counselor, the Empress summoned Guntram. He was given the title of Margrave and a place in her court. The new Margrave gratefully left Somber End at 21 years of age to get everything he'd ever wanted as the advisor to the empire. But Guntram, like a cog in a clock, is just part of the story. The springs and gears and coils of this story, its very heart, concern Alphonsus and Esme, two children whom the people of Rhinevelt would call saviors, whom all would claim performed miracle feats, and whom Guntram would try to kill. So that's how we lead into a story about Alphonsus and Esme, who both go on quests to learn a little bit more about themselves. Uh, Alphonsus, we learn, has in place of a heart, he has a clock. He doesn't know where it came from. And one day there's an accident and the clock begins running back, backwards. Uh, Esme comes from a faraway land uh, and is on a, in a very important mission that I'm not going to spoil what that is because it's truly shocking. Um, let's conclude that for my part of the evening. I'm much better at question and answer. So I'm just gonna wrap things up now and say thank you so much for listening to me and hope you enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you so much, Brian. That's a great way to, to kick things off. I was telling, I think I was telling Kate Allen last time, we, in the last one of these events, how much I have like relearned to enjoy literature aimed at, at young readers because it's just, it gets at all, it does get at all the right questions and I appreciate that. So our next reader this evening will be Linda Lagarde Grover, who writes fiction, poetry, and memoir, and her most recent book is In the Night of Memory. Linda, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, and um, hello, everyone, and hello in Grand Rapids and the area up there. I've been there many, many times. I, um, I am um, working on something that's going to be published probably close to a year from now that has to do with the um it's sort of a memoir and it has to do with um with the land up here and the landscape and um people living on it on it over you know over um over many many centuries and that really is what the rest of my work really has been about i have um a couple of um i have a a book of poetry that is called um, The Sky Watched Poems of Ojibwe Lives, which has to do with that landscape and, and uh, the time since creation and up through today. I, I wrote a, a book of very short essays called Onagamasing Seasons of an Ojibwe Year, which is very, very short little stories about historical things and contemporary life and living in Duluth here in Onagamasing and family and people I know. And then I have three works of fiction and they all, everything I do takes place up here in Northeastern Minnesota. And it takes place, a lot of it, um, just north of Lake Superior in the Arrowhead region, and sometimes along the lake shore and sometimes inland. I write about a fictional reservation, which is sort of like my own reservation, Boys Fort, but it is fictional. The first fiction book I have, um, The Dance Boots, is about an extended family and reservation community in northeastern Minnesota and focuses on the the um, the boarding school era, the Indian boarding school era, and effects of that uh, separation of families during the time more than 100 years ago up through the time today. The second one is The Road Back to Sweetgrass, which tells more of a story of um, times through like the 50s through I don't know, the 90s, and about that takes place during the termination policies when um, government policy was to, um, to attempt to terminate tribes and tribal status. And it's that, that's, uh, that is told, it, that's the backdrop. And then there um, are young women who come of age in the early 70s. And so the, that story is told through those, those young women. And so my, my latest book, In the Night of Memory, 
also takes place in northeastern Minnesota in Duluth and on uh, that fictional Moje Point Reservation. And this moves to another generation of that large extended family. And it's, uh, the story is told, the main vehicle is uh, two sisters who are born in the early to mid seventies who go into the foster system and are um, removed from their mom and their family. And then uh, eventually through the, through the efforts of the tribe and the Indian Tribal Welfare Act are returned to some relatives. But the running thread through this is that their, their mother goes missing after they are signed over to the county and she's, she's gone. And so their lives are lived with that, that big hole in it that they, they don't know where she is and, and all their relatives are, are in, this, in that situation too. There's someone missing and they don't know where she went and they don't know if she will ever return or be found. So I'm going to read a little bit from one of the relatives here who um, I like. Her name is Auntie Gurley and she's a very, very old person. And she's just going to tell us a little bit of the story. So the girls are called Azure and Rainy and their mother's name, their missing mother is Loretta. This, this lady is um, an, an aunt, a very ancient aunt and her, her name is Gurley. So this is something that Auntie Gurley has to say. <clears throat> I was thinking all yesterday, all afternoon and through supper and my programs on TV right up to my bedtime, though not once my head hit the pillow because I sleep like a sack of rocks, always have. It was yesterday that Noli Dulaban, that would be my cousin Beryl's grandson, while he does the Moje Masinegan, the reservation newsletter that comes out once a month, and he came to elder housing for lunch. He wanted to interview me because I am the oldest Moje Point elder. By far, I'm adding that last part myself. He wanted to know about the old days, which all the younger people like to read about because they are so different from things today that to them, Moje in those times might have been like living on the planet Jupiter. Elder housing is a nice place, and I'm glad to live here on the ridge that runs along the southern shore of Lost Lake. There's a nice view here out of every one of our rooms and out of the dining room too, where Noli ate every scrap of his macaroni and cheese and half of mine while I talked. The portions here are not enough for younger people. And because Noli can't ever hang on to his money, I think he probably didn't have enough to buy a second lunch for himself. He ended the interview by asking me the secret to a long life. When people ask me that, they are really asking why in the world I'm not dead yet. And I mean this in a good way. Whiskey and cigars, I answered, which made him laugh. But then I told him what these Oshki pointers would expect to read in the Masi Nagan, that every morning, the first thing I do is thank God for making me an Indian and then try my best to walk the path of Bimadazi when the traditional Anishinaabe way of living a good life. Then Noli packed up his laptop computer that he was taking notes on and shook my hand in a thoughtfully gentle way that didn't hurt my fingers, which are sore and strangely crooked with the arthritis, and said it was an honor to interview me. Before you die, which could be any minute, I could tell he was thinking. The truth is, of course, that I don't smoke cigars and I don't drink, at least not in the way my mother Maggie and her sister Helen did, though I do like a glass of wine while I watch my programs. The reason I have lived longer than anyone, even Beryl's husband, Noel, who was older than Sin, is because I never married. Nobody ever asked me or even showed interest. I was never chosen. And so my heart never took the beating that other women's do. Maggie's held out as long as it could, but between my father and then Lewis and then her children and all the Moje Point and Duluth relatives, it wore out when she was just 60. Mine is still beating, steady and slow, never subject to the highs and lows of emotions, the long-term sorrowful slowing and abrupt jarring of the joys and frights that people like Maggie experienced. 
My secret to a long life is also my secret to a clear head and memory. I am untouched and bear no scars on my heart that beats as slow and cold-blooded as a turtle's. The creator blessed me in this. It's a gift. So that is, um, that's Aunt Gurley. And so In the Night of Memory has um, a number of different voices of relatives and people who, people who have known Loretta and know the history of the reservation and of, of the families. So her girls sometimes speak and um, Loretta herself appears a couple times in the book. So even though the stories about her and her children, they are not present during the whole time of this story. So um, it's been a it's been a pleasure to read here, and I I um, enjoyed listening to Brian, and I look forward to hearing hearing the other people who have who have come. So Miigwech, talk to you soon. Thanks. I I love. I love Auntie Gurley. I really am glad that that you chose to read that section. Um, it just makes me makes me happy. Our next reader this evening is Sean Otto. He is also a two-time Minnesota Book Award winner for his nonfiction science writing, and he is probably going to share something quite scientific with us this evening. <laughs> Sean, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I write, uh, I'm a science writer. I'm also a movie writer. Uh, I wrote the movie House of Sand and Fog, uh, which I adapted from Andre de Buse's novel of the same title, which was up for a couple of Oscars. And the novel most recently, Sins of Our Fathers, um, which was a finalist, it's a literary thriller, was a finalist for the uh, LA Times Book Award and won the Northeast Minnesota Book Award. Um, but what I've really been talking a lot about lately is the War on Science, um, which won the Minnesota Book Award and is based on my work talking about the critical importance of science and its role in democracy. And I've been all over the world talking about this because people are so concerned about what's going on in America. Uh, and why uh, we have uh, wound up in a situation where so many people uh, don't understand uh, science and don't value its role in democracy. So a lot of people, a lot of you probably maybe have like a crazy uncle Charlie or crazy uncle Greg or somebody like that that comes to dinner uh, and you have those uncomfortable conversations and you wonder how he got that way. Um, and what I really want to share is a slide from one of my talks um, that helps people to understand how this happens, because I think it's, it's really important to understand how it happens if we're going to be able to reach across uh, the communication divide and help people out of that. So I just want to um, share this and take you through about maybe 10 minutes or so of what's going on. There is an industry that grew up uh, in, particularly in the 2000, 2010 period called the product defense industry. And what they do, they were given a, a lot of spending by the fossil fuel industry during that time. Uh, really about 2 billion bucks was spent, most of it in the year 2010, in order to defeat the Obama climate bill. And that created a vast infrastructure of uh, a mix of public relations and phony science uh, that serves as a foundation of that PR. And the target was the Republican Party and particularly Republican influencers, donors, and activists, because if they could uh, influence those relatively few people, they could surround Republican lawmakers uh, in the Senate with enough uh, concern that they would kill the bill. And with that level of investment, it created an infrastructure. It, imagine the businesses that that was funding, well, they had a very successful strategy that they developed. So then they began looking around for other businesses that they could apply this to. And 
disinformation and anti-science communication spread from fossil fuels into uh, the health effects of sugar and tobacco and issues around farming and pharmaceuticals and atrazine and mining and opioids and many other uh, areas of largely commodity industries that were subject to regulation. And the short circuiting of regulation was the goal of this spending. So I talk about a little ditty about Jack and Diane and I make apologies here to John Cougar uh, ripping him off a little bit here, but Jack is a lawyer and Diane is a scientist. Uh, and Jack goes to work uh, at his law firm and da Diane goes to the lab and she works on climate science. And, and Jack uh, goes to, like many lawyers, things like the center of the American experiment for lunch meetings where you socialize with uh, people who are business owners or wealthy professionals uh, who might become good law clients. Uh, they might need you. Uh, but those also tend to have a high overlap with likely Republican donors, and they are a target of these firms. This is a picture of Fred Singer, who recently passed away, but Fred is a guy who spent uh, his uh, later career going around spreading climate disinformation at groups like this, uh, targeting very intelligent people with untrue fake science. Now, Jack gets back to the office and he wonders a little bit about this and he pulls up the Drudge Report on his computer and he sees headlines about NOAA fiddling with climate data to erase the 15 year global warming hiatus. And that satellite data shows there's really been no global warming for nearly 19 years. And this is just a spin that Mike Drudge puts on headlines in order to uh, get people to read them, but it tends to be taken as fact. Then he goes to the water cooler where he talks with the other lawyers that were at the luncheon and you know, they say, wow, that guy really knew his stuff. He was really convincing. Even though he was fooling them with statistics and that we don't have time to go into how that's done, but there's a lot of peer pressure that comes into the opinion formation uh, of intelligent professional people. Uh, so Jack goes and checks out, does a little more research online because he knows from talking with Diane that, that really there, there seems to be a lot of scientists who say that global warming is real. And he finds this report by the NIPCC, uh, why scientists disagree about global warming. And he's heard of the NIPCC, aren't they? That international group that does these heavily publicized meetings where thousands of scientists get together in different countries every few years. Well, no, actually, that is the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, uh, the or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is the Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change. It is a propaganda packet put together by none other than Fred Singer and some other people at the Heartland Institute outside of Chicago, and it's full of spin. And then driving home, he hears Rush Limbo, one of the first recipients of climate denial advertising money uh, from the Southern Company, uh, in the early 90s, uh, talking about how it's all a hoax and the target is you, the people of the United States of America. He looks down at his seat and he sees a copy of Environment and Climate News, uh, which is mailed out free of charge to uh, most lobbyists and most state legislators and federal lawmakers, as well as lawyers who deal with them free of charge. And it has a lot of articles that he noticed seem to call climate change into question as well. But down in the right hand corner, you can see upside down there, the return address is the Heartland Institute. This is another fake news uh, publication that's really PR put out designed to spin uh, lawmakers and Republican influencers. Uh, he drives past a billboard that says, wind dies, sun sets you need reliable, affordable, clean coal electricity, even though there's no such thing as clean coal. Uh, he gets home and Diane's stuck at the lab and he's preparing dinner for the kids and, and he turns on Fox News because that's what all the guys at the office talk about and he wants to be able to talk to him the next day, not be the 
nerd that's out of the loop. Uh, and they're talking about climate change and how there's a whistleblower that's pointing to manipulated data. So maybe that Drudge Report thing was true. Uh, when in fact, this is just a typical spin up of Drudge and other climate change uh, misinformation uh, picked up by the mainstream media. Uh, so Diane gets home finally and she says, no, 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 this is a bunch of nonsense. Really, what you need to do is go to the National Academy's site and check it out. They have links to the original research and you can find all the material that you need. Climate change is totally real. In fact, it's the most known and established science now outside of the understanding of, of evolution. And we have billions and billions and billions of data points, and they're all pointing in the same direction, all the lines of evidence confirming and cross-confirming each other. Uh, so that's one point in Diane's favor, a little bit of evidence compared to all the spin that he's been exposed to in the course of his daily professional life because of the demographic that he happens to be a part of. He. Uh, helps his daughter with her homework uh, before bed. And in the textbook, the online chapter that they go through, there is a section on global warming and it poses it as a dichotomy. What do you think? Is it a result of human activity? And it talks about how it's part of a natural climactic change. And some scientists suggest that this is caused by human activity. Others say, no, that's natural. What do you think? And this is part of a textbook series that's targeted at Texas because they're the largest textbook market, uh, but it winds up being picked up by schools around the country. And in fact, this information was financed uh, and this language was financed by fossil fuel product defense firms like the Heartland Institute. He, after she goes to bed, he posts uh, on Facebook a link to the uh, uh, study that or the National Academy's page that Diane talked about and how the NASA information really is real big mistake. He gets all kinds of bots uh, from the industry as well as haters uh, and trolls uh, shaming him in public, embarrassing him, making him feel terrible uh, and professionally endangering him since a lot of his clients view his uh, attitudes that he posted as an outlier. And this sticks to him and it makes him feel crappy the rest of the night. Uh, one of his uh, co-workers says, you really ought to check out this link here. There are over 30,000 scientists that say catastrophic global warming is a complete hoax and a science lie. Of course, neither one of them knows that this Oregon petition, which is what this is, uh, classifies someone as a scientist if they have a BS degree, undergrad degree in science of some sort. It just has to be a BS degree. They don't have to have any expertise or knowledge of climate science at all. So more propaganda and PR. At uh, their li little local neighborhood mega church, uh, they get together and the pastor there, who is also part of the target demographic, uh, Protestant pastors are heavily targeted because of their connections typically to uh, Republican influencers. Uh, talks about dominion theory and about how uh, God uh, controls when the earth ends. Man will not end this earth in a, in a flood and we should be more humble. Uh, Breitbart uh, uh, gives him further news uh, that's misinformation the next day when he goes to check it out. Uh, he runs into his boss. He has to drive him to the airport. And the, and the boss says, don't worry about what happened on Facebook. Debate is good, which is another talking point. If uh, you want to open up uh, something that's very well established and create doubt, debate is good. Uh, and it's good for an attorney, but it's not necessarily good when all the facts are actually uh, pointing somewhere else. Uh, on the golf course that weekend with a client, uh, they get snowed out by a sudden cold burst and the client says, hey, some global warming, eh? So you can begin to see what's happening to Diane here. She's getting blocked out by all these data points. And what these product defense firms realize through a lot of research is that people really are scientific in the way that they form opinions about reality. 
they collect evidence from the world around them and they look for patterns and they look for evidence that cross confirms other bits of evidence to form their opinions and their worldviews. So you don't have to argue with them. All you have to do is give them little bits of evidence and lead them down the garden path and they will form the conclusions themselves. And once they do, it's very, very hard to move them off of those positions. So Jack sees Jim Inhofe uh, confirming this idea that it's you know just weird weather by bringing a snowball onto the Senate floor in that famous moment. And Diane is all but gone from his thinking about this. Uh, he goes along to get along and join the guys and everything is easier except for Diane, but he dismisses her. She's just a woman, touchy-feely, and she's a tree hugger. So he thinks that, and which is common, common phrasing uh, from Rush Limbaugh and the like. Uh, two years later, they get divorced, and Diane cites this as the moment that she lost him. And this is happening in families around America. This is the network of people that uh, Donald Trump accessed and went straight to in order to work around the Republican Party infrastructure. And this is the network of people uh, that is uh, behind convincing uh, people that reality is not what they think it is. So I'll let it go there. Oof, okay. <laughs> Thank you, though, Sean. That that was it was it's fascinating and disheartening and fascinating. Uh, I'm gonna bring our last writer, Sun Yang Shin, to the, the virtual stage. She has won the Minnesota Book Award for her poetry, and she has founded Poetry Asylum with fellow Minnesota poet Su Huang. Please welcome Sun Yang Shin. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Linda, Brian, and Sean. It's really beautiful readings. And thanks um, for being here. I wish I could see, we could see you all. Um, looking forward to getting back to live readings. So yeah, I'm Sun Young. This, um, this is my book that won the Minnesota Book Award for Poetry and it's called Unbearable Slender. I'm going to read just one poem. Everything in here is long and um, there's a lot of pictures and there's essays as well. So I'm going to read one that is a little bit more of a poem poem. And this whole book is um, really about the politics of hospitality. And as an immigrant poet, it's something I think about a lot or just as an immigrant in general, I think about um, hospitality and the nature of the United States um, as an as an empire and um, what its relationship to its citizens and guests are and um, a lot of this book is organized around the idea of um, the fact that the word guests the words guest and host have the same root word um, and so I use a lot of myth and I use a lot of um, symbols in my work too. So this poem is called Paradise and it's inspired by Dante's Paradiso and then this illustration in particular of Paradise and the rings. Um, so this spatial cosmology has always really interested me. All right, so there's um, just ten, 10 little sections. The first is called First Sphere, the moon, inconstant. When I was a child, I had a rocking horse, a horse on thick springs, its mane ever tousled in the exact same way, day after year. I would ride it into a hole in the ground that opened just for me, just for my horse and me. The passage of time below was inconstant while time above rocked back and forth on its unseen springs. 
Second sphere, Mercury, the ambitious. My dream was to reach paradise wherever it was, through the tunnel, along the swinging bridge, down the shaft, through cave after cave. What came through, trains and babies with their nurses and businessmen dressed all alike. Each time I was tempted to plant mines behind me that would flower into fire, preventing me from being followed. Third sphere, Venus, the lovers. In my saddlebag, I carried hearts that I had found among the crowds above ground. I carved my name on their surprisingly tough surfaces as though they were picnic tables, a pastoral banquet waiting for me. Fourth sphere, the sun, the wise. It is dangerous to be wise. You might be called upon to separate mating snakes, eat their skin, be cursed to live as a woman for seven years, to marry and bear children and turn back again, burdened by knowledge by this metamorphosis. Fifth sphere, Mars, the warriors of the faith. So many ways to kill the faithless. Every body can be broken, burned, a bane, a bond. To destroy my enemies, I need only join them, transforming them into my brothers, my family, my people. Sixth sphere, Jupiter, the just rulers. We are guests above the ground. While alive, we are uncanny, always falling back into wilderness. Our vegetable love outlasts the centuries, outlasts the protean nature of the justice of the day. Addicted to authority, the ground littered with needles, our blood mingled and tainted, impure. You cannot escape me now because I am inside you. Seventh sphere, Saturn, the contemplatives. No more hangings, no more gas chambers. No one allowed to remain in the center of the labyrinth, guarding their DNA from the world, from the future. No more contemplation, no more waste. Everyone leaning toward paradise. Shields down and the word enemy will pass from memory. You are my kind. Eighth sphere, the fixed stars, faith, hope, and love. At the end of the world, we will move through this wild, infinite palace, gardens with the softest of flowers, folded, mellow light, all unruly, every room filled with animals risen from extinction, the taste of sacrifice still on our lips, all atoms equal, every snake biting its own tail and every child tearing down the tent. Ninth sphere, the primum mobile, the angels. At the end of the world, everything will be winged. My neck is a door. Walk through it to the rough and savage woods inside me. Take your torch and burn any monsters to hot ash and dust. I can cough everything out and back into this blazing world. Ax to the frozen sea, hexes and incantations, yesterday's reverie, Usher in every little last thing you have. And the last one, M the Empyrean. At last, light all around us, your body a room of lamps, every wick lit as though it were the world's last birthday. Time is now inside you, transfer and possession, never holding anything back, indifferent to my illegitimacy, disinterested in my grief, pierced with all of my joy, inside me a second better person, furnished with perfect recall, my convict, my warden, my guest, my host. Thank you very much. Delightful, I really, I really needed to hear that poem in particular tonight, San Young, I really, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that one to the table. I'm, yeah, <laughs> feeling that one. Um, friends, if if we would be so kind as to answer some questions now, that would be fantastic. I'm appreciative of all of the words that you have shared. 
um, audience, if you've got anything for our lovely authors this evening, now is a great time to put them in the chat. Uh, to begin with, I should like to offer uh, a question for us to consider. Since you've all written multiple books, um, I'm curious about how your, your, your process has evolved over time. Um, do you find that you write for different reasons now than when you first began writing? So I, both portions of the question, either portion of the question that, that speaks to you more uh, is, is up for grabs. Um, but. First of all, I wanna thank, say thank you to uh, Sun Young for uh, lightening the mood a little bit after, <laughs> after uh, my depressing talk. Um, I think that when I write nonfiction, I'll take a, a stab at it. Uh, when I write nonfiction, especially about science right now, it's, it's motivated by kind of a sense of justice and injustice. Um, and I think that that actually motivates my fiction writing in a lot of ways too. I'm really, when I look back on it, I'm really concerned about justice. Um, and that theme runs really strong. Um, so that impassions me in, in, in a number of different ways. Linda, are you going to go? All right. Um, I, I just write in, in bits and pieces. Usually I don't have a, um, I don't have a schedule. So if there's something that I feel that, it, you know, I'd like to write, then I, then I do it. And then if I, if I don't, I don't, it's, um, if I have a deadline and there's something that I, that I need to do, then I'm, I'm actually really pretty productive. It kind of surprised me. I had to, I had to write something a while ago and I was really surprised. I thought, well, I, if only I had that kind of discipline for myself, who knows what, what <laughs> might happen here. So I, I put together, you know, I, I hang on to bits and pieces of things. And then after a while, they seem to sort of, um, they seem to kind of form a, a picture, kind of like a, a jigsaw puzzle. And that's when I kind of fit them together and write around them and stuff. And um, I have, you know, I want, I want to tell a story. You know, I, I mean, I, my research is on, on families and individuals, women and children and federal Indian policies. And so I want to tell a story like that, that somebody just walking through a bookstore or a library might pick up and read who might not necessarily even think about reading some type of research and and it's a lot more fun to do it this way too so um so that's why why i do it and and how i do it it's um you know i it's uh it's fun mm -hmm. i guess for me, I've I've noticed a change in my process in the last few years, uh, largely in that I I've, I come from where a lot of people say you know, in order to be a writer, you must write every day. This is Peanut. He's about to come on screen. He's he's fine. Don't worry about him. Um, and so. I beat myself up for a long time because I couldn't write every day. And eventually I learned, okay, you don't have to write every day. Just, you know. um, and it was funny because, you know, Linda was talking about some days I feel like it, some days I don't. And that's exactly where I'm at. Um, but I, it, it took me a lot of time to uh, learn that about myself and, and just kind of give into it. A lot of what it was, to be honest, about five years ago, I was officially diagnosed with ADHD, which I wish I had known that when I was a kid. <laughs> it's one of those things that as soon as I learned that, I went back through my life and went, oh, that's why, yeah, I could have done better in school. And, but what I've, what I've come to think of in my process is I've, I'm starting to what I call lean into the ADHD, where if, if I'm working on this because I have to, but my brain wants to work on this, I'm, I'll switch to this. I was like, hey, this is where my brain wants to be. There's a reason for that. That's where the creativity is gonna go. Um, I used to just, I used to be like, nope, nope, I must get this done. But now I've learned that it's much easier to give in to that 
work on this other thing. And then eventually the brain will work its way back to the thing that I should be working on. Do I miss a lot of deadlines? Oh yeah, yeah, a lot. Um, but it's, it, and, I, and I know I'm not the only writer who has this problem of coming up with ideas that you wanna work on when you should be working on something else. But like I said, I just lean into it now and say, hey, I, I, the brain wants what it wants. So that's how I take, that's how I approach everything now. Love it. Um, I think my process hasn't changed so much. It's always been just sort of slapdash. Um, I mean, very re reading oriented. Like um, I used to continue to be really interested in incorporating a lot of documents. And my latest book that I haven't really taken time yet to promote. So it's with an art gallery and not. Um, a pub like book publisher but I will maybe at some point when we figure out our um federal government but so like granted to a foreign citizen is my latest project that just came out a few weeks ago and I use you know it's all about my naturalization documents and process and kind of the languages around that and this is the current reading vocabulary for the naturalization test from the US Citizenship and Immigration Services. And that's like what it looks like on the website right now. If you, and the, then I made a, a word find poem out of it. Um, there was an, you know, I, I showed some of the work um, on Payne Avenue a couple of weeks ago. There was a gallery walk, um, solidarity walk. But the, you know, the two people are Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. Other words are um, colors, dollar bill, first, largest, many, most, north, one people, second, south. Um, you know, on the, on the civics, one of the words is father of our country and it's all in capitals. So I mean, I, I, as a poet, I just really look closely at language and even to you know things like spelling and capitalization, and so that process, that that aspect of writing continues for me. One um, something that it changed has changed or evolved is just as I've gotten older. My um, I think because I started writing in the twentieth century, and I felt a little bit hopeful as that century was turning, and I wrote you know, the poems that I wrote around that time were about, you know, that the 20th century, which saw all of this mechanized war and mass, mass destruction, the rise of weapons of mass destruction and these world wars and genocides. I, I know we're only 20 years into the next century, but at that time I thought, well, maybe we've learned and we um, won't have as much armed conflict. We won't have as much, um, you know, but the United States has been in endless war since, um, you know, my children were born and their whole lives. Like, so this whole generation of young people. Um, so that I think my writing is, I'm really trying to confront, um, you know, where we are in the century. And also then as I get older, just my perspective shifts on toward what is my job looking toward being an, an elder. And um, yeah, so that's, those are some things I'd say about that. Thanks for that question, Wendy. Yeah, thank you for those those varied and fantastic answers. I could pick. I feel like I could pick your brain about you know your 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 role as someone who's you know growing into the 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 elder <laughs> son young. I I feel like I have no idea how to occupy the middle of my life and uh, in a way that makes any sense. <laughs> Um, and I also feel greatly, Brian and Linda, that as, as someone who can't, as, as someone who likes to write but can't finish a damn thing, maybe I can learn from bits of your, <laughs> bits of your processes and, and, and put something, put something in, in place that works. It's good to, it's good to hear. 
<laughs> I could say something here. I, yeah. I, I would like to encourage anybody who's wanting to write to just do that. And you, I mean, my, my first book was published when I was 59. And I mean, I wrote in bits and pieces all my life and actually never even saved anything. Of course, now that we have, now that we have computers, I mean, everything is saved, you know, oh my God, that's saved. Um, but I, but I would encourage people to do that. And for the longest time, I kept my stuff as I got to have a pile of it. I had it in file folders and, um, and I had them in a, in a cardboard box that was just folded over at the top. And um, now, now, I, now I have my stuff on my laptop, but, you know, just hang, I think, hang on to that stuff. And I, I found that that really eventually, and when it was, I guess, when it was meant to be, to have things and I had to have some experience and some living and some observation and I've you know I've been around for a while and so I think with with that that gave me a perspective as I started putting stuff together and it's um so just you know do it you don't have to write a whole book and you know write a if you have an idea even write it down I used to have a I used to have a plastic you know grocery bag that I used to just stuff things in and had that hanging on a doorknob and um, I don't know, just, just anything like that worked, worked for me. Yeah, I agree. I would like to echo that, that um, just write, if you want to write, if you're interested in it, and I assume if you're tuning in to listen mm -hmm. to us tonight, you probably are. Um, the most important thing is to write and everybody's process is different. I talked to Kate DiCamillo once um, and she said she writes two pages a day and puts it away, even if she's in the middle of a sentence and that's it. Mm -hmm. And that keeps her thinking about it over the course of the day. I could personally never write that way. That would drive me crazy. <clears throat> I have to, partly I think because I'm so insecure about losing track of the threads that I'm trying to maintain, um, I tend to write pretty obsessively and then to stop um, once I get to a breaking point, which probably makes it harder for me in some ways, but I'm, you know, I'm different from Kate and, and from the other writers here on the screen. We each approach it differently. It's always hard. Your third book or fourth book is just as hard as your first one. And you always have, at least if you're doing something that's, that's not formulaic, you know, you're always inventing something new you're always looking for something that motivates you. Um, it makes you mad or it makes you sad or it makes you excited or it makes you wanna learn. And you think of a person that's right in the thick of that and what's their story? What, what is it like for them? And just start writing, there's your assignment. Fantastic advice. I, I love being the audience stand-in person because I imagine that there are people who like to read and write out there. And so I try to position myself as this we're audience human, but uh, it doesn't always work. But this is it's fantastic. Um, we're, we're a little quiet over in the chat. I keep gesturing here. My chat is in the right side of my screen. But um, I, because we're kind of circling this a little bit, I'm I'm just, another question that I sort of hang on to is, do any of you work with um, writing groups and, and how do you, if you do, or just even, even in situations like this, how do you benefit from the experience of other writers? So I have. I have, um, when I was uh, particularly working uh, as a screenwriter or starting to work as a screenwriter, um, I was in a screenwriting group and that really helped because I just felt supported by other people who were staying committed. It's kind of like, you know, AA, it just keeps you committed uh, and you have to keep going and showing some kind of progress. Um, but I think again, at different points in people's lives, we probably are all, all feel differently about it. Um, right now, sometimes I really miss my my old writers group and wish that they were around. But I write on my own mostly now, and I have readers that I go to then, and I and I get feedback. 
Yeah. I'm all alone. So I, um, I, I have never been in a writer's group. Um, I'm just, I, I, I don't know. I just can't, I just can't bring myself to br put my stuff out there. And once I used to read some things out loud to my husband, but he kept falling asleep when I did this. And so, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not sure it, it might be my voice, but it might be something else. So, you know, I, I work alone and, um, and I, I don't mind reading other people's stuff that they're working on sometimes, but I also really worry about other people's stuff influencing what I do. And so I really, when I'm reading stuff and I read, I mean, I'm reading a horror book right now that I really like. Um, it's called the, it's called the grace year. Anyway, so I had to kind of put that down as I'm doing something else. Cause I, I don't want to, I don't know, pollute each other's writing or something. So I'm just, I'm really worried about, about taking other people's influence into my stuff and almost like appropriating stuff. So, and I'm also very, very um, introverted um, with my stuff. I, I don't know. I feel bad. I feel like I should be with a group sometimes, but I just, I just haven't done it. I had a group several years ago. They were great. They were people I could always go to for uh, honest feedback. Um, then my life got to be too much and I had to drop out of the group and I haven't really found a new group yet. I would love to find uh, more people to read stuff, but I also worry that given how busy I am with lots of things, I wouldn't have the time. So um, it was, it was helpful for me when I, when I had my group and they were really good about catching logistical errors and uh, just helping me talk through some, some problems I was having. So I do recommend writing groups. They can be very good. Yeah, I don't have, I don't have a group. I've never really successfully been in a group. I, I, part of that might be that I, I teach a lot and for 13 years I taught high school and there's just a lot of reading and writing and feedback on, on words and um, to, unruly children. Um, yeah, it just seemed hard to find the time, but also I, my, my work is so, it's kind of weird and it's, yeah. So I've usually written alone. I do have a few people here and there over the years, um, but I always advise my students to, especially when they're starting out to not not necessarily don't do this, but that my advice is like, don't show your partner, partners, friends, uh, your writing, because like one comment that is meant, is like well-meaning, but just can crush your spirit as a, as a new writer, or even as an older, like whatever, not older, but you know, as a more um, experienced writer, because unless they're also writers kind of in the same, at the same place, um, they're just going to have a different, you know, they're just going to have a different um, approach generally. In my experience over these 20 whatever years of writing, and um, if you're very lucky, if you have a partner who's like a good reader or your first reader, and some people have that, or who have um, friends who aren't writers, but who are good readers, you know, so that's gold. It's like wealth right there, but just don't expect that don't expect that of your friends and family, and then you will never have your heart broken or be discouraged by their responses. That's my advice. Fantastic. Advice. I totally agree with that. I just want to say I've started, I, I've stopped showing anything to my spouse or close friends. I used to say it's like pulling a baby out of the uterus and then trying to stick it back in and hoping everything. <laughs> I've never done yeah, that. that uh. <laughs> it doesn't always work out so well when you do that. Um, but it's also, I found that it, it's too defining, even if they are sensitive, um, just the act of sharing it doesn't allow, it commits me too much and it doesn't allow me to 
take a different tact with it if I feel that I have to after I've gone further. Yeah. We do have a question from our audience. Uh, Leslie asks about pandemic writing. Um, has it been helpful for your work or has it been tougher for you? It's been helpful for me because I've been stuck here. And so I really can't go anywhere else. And, you know, um, I, I think it's actually made it possible for me to focus more. Not that I would like to continue living like this, but um, so I wouldn't say, oh yes, it's been just wonderful. But in that way, it's, um, it's kind of forced me to do this. Also to sort through my fabric stash and, you know, all kinds of things. Ugh. Mm -hmm. Hi, Leslie. I'll, um, I don't know that it's been, I don't think it's been helpful for my work, although I feel like I've been more productive than I think I have if I actually stop to think about it. But um, I've gotten, I've read a lot more than I would have. Um, I've had a lot more, um, yeah, spaces to read, even though I'm working as much as before, because I'm not spending so much time driving around and just stressed out by like the to and fro. Um, so yeah, that's, I've read a lot of really wonderful books and that's been really uh, wonderful, grateful for that side effect. I, I was, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Ryan. Oh. Okay. I, I found I had to channel my creative energy in new ways when, when the lockdown started. My brain didn't want to do any long form writing. Um, it was it was really not wanting to do. It was, it was stress. It was everything else that everybody's experiencing. And and from what I've seen, people I follow online on Twitter and so on, this has not been uh, an isolated issue. A lot of writers had problems when it started. But what I did was I said, okay, so what can I handle? If I can't handle novels, what can I do? And and, it, and, I, and I thought about this just because Sean was talking about screenwriting. Um, when, this, when everything hit, I said, you know, I haven't done any screenwriting since college. Let's, let's see if my brain will go there. And it did. Um, I have just been churning stuff out left, right, center. Um, it was really good to kind of switch forms um, that, that allowed me to still be creative and have an outlet. Um, and it was, it was kind of giving my brain a break. Not, not that screenwriting is easy, um, but it was just a different way of thinking. And I think once I got my brain to go, okay, think in these terms, um, I was able to kind of let that and my creativity join. Um, and I've been having a lot of fun doing that. I think for me, the danger is um, to not let um, the pandemic and the, the kind of the overwhelming topicality of that become too much of an influence in what I'm writing about. Um, because this too shall pass. Um, and that's not where I'm at. That's not what I want to have um, influencing the, the core part of the story that I'm working on. Um, on the other hand, you know, oppression is always good for creativity. Limitations are always good for creativity. Um, and there's a certain um, energy, I think, that comes from having those boundaries set, even though we don't like it. Um, I think when we all look back, we'll find that we've been really creative in different ways. Thanks. Um, Kelsey has asked what you're reading right now. And I'm always curious about this too. I know Linda mentioned a book, but Linda could talk more about that book. What, of oh, The Grace Year? Yeah. I'm, a, I'm about, I started it yesterday evening and I'm probably about three quarters of the way through. So it, it's a young adult book, but it's it's like over 400 pages. I mean, but it really, it moves. And I, I, I heard that somebody just bought the movie rights to it. So it's, um, I can see that this would be a very popular 
popular book and movie. So I'm going to wait and see what happens with it. I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's, uh, it really moves. But I have to say, I read in the last, I've, I've read a lot too lately. And um, I read um, The 29th Day by Alex Messenger. And that's about a, a young, a Duluth man when he was 18, 17, um, was way up in Canada and was mauled by a grizzly bear. And it's, uh, I thought it was a, it's a, I think it's a really, I thought it was really interesting. I mean, it's really detailed um, about their, you know, about their camping and, um, and the, the terrain. And I, I thought it was, I thought it was a really good book. But I have to say, I read Rules for Visiting, and I cannot remember right now who wrote that. But that's one of the best books that I've read in just a long time. It, you know, it's, um, it has to do with, um, uh, uh, with, um, trees figure a lot in that and um the there's really a spiritual presence of human beings and trees and loss and um and a sense of self and how that fits in with everything in this narrative about a, a middle-aged woman who's going to go and visit some of her hook up with hook up um some of her longtime friends and um in that I just I just thought it was so beautiful. I mean that book has I finished it like about five days ago and I can't stop thinking about it. I love that feeling. So I have just mm -hmm. added that to my list because I have had a hard time finding anything that sucks me in in a while. So written down. <laughs> I have to laugh because I'm getting called out by this question because I just talked about if I don't like the pandemic to be too influential. And the book that I just finished reading was The Road by Cormac McCarthy. <laughs> and before that, I read Station Eleven again. So. <clears throat> I am typing. Um, I just started Fathoms the World in the Whale by Rebecca Griggs. It's, oh, I don't know if I can. Um, on Libby, it's uh, it's about the life of whales and what they can teach us about ourselves, our planet, and our relationship to other species, um, and how whales are experiencing ecological change, um, and the how their how their bodies um, absorb the chemical waste from human activity. Um, it's just, I just started it. A friend is reading it, another writer. I also, you know, Moby Dick is one of my favorite books of all time. And um, I also feel like everything that I do has to be about in some way or another, has to be informed by um, our climate extinction um, situation and that we need to apply our collective creativity to adapting, um, not just for ourselves, but for all of the other life forms on the planet that um, many we have already doomed to you know, extinction. Species that have been in the same form, in the same morphology for millions of years, survived on this planet for millions of years in the same you know, suddenly have to um, contend with just our industrial, you know, 100 years of intense pressures. So um, I feel like artists, I mean, any, any human, any American, because we produce the most waste, um, and any artist needs to be turning our creativity to this larger project of, um, you know, evolving mm -hmm. and, you know, along with the things Sean was talking about and just in general decolonizing and indigenizing our ways of life. Um, so yeah, this book I'm really interested in and just more uh, kinds of books that are, that are about the convergence of, um, kind of social movements into one movement. Um, and that not, you know, not having all these siloed movements like the environmental movement, which has been, you know, very white. Um, and so other, other ways that 
Native activists and people of color activists and writers and thinkers are leading us to see the connections between everything. Yes. <laughs> the world, the whale, the whale, the whales. Yeah. Write that one down too. Mammals. Uh, I guess as for me, um, I mentioned I'd been doing some screenwriting and uh, I, years ago, back when I was in college, um, I wrote a screenplay about the life of Orson Welles. Um, and, you know, this was a bazillion years ago before there was Microsoft Word and I long ago lost it. And then I've thought about it fondly over the years. Oh, maybe I'll try doing that again. Well, Two weeks ago, I was going through some old boxes and I found a hard copy of this screenplay that I wrote in college about the life of Orson Welles. And I read it and I went, wow, this needs work. <laughs> um, but it, it, it wasn't awful. There was, there was, I was like, oh, there's something here. So I'm, I'm, I've been reading some Orson Welles biographies to kind of get my brain back in that line of thinking and I might take a stab at fixing that screenplay if, if that works, but he had a fascinating life. He was a very strange man. It's like a very collegiate thing to, to do is to write a screenplay about the life of Orson Welles. Like I kind of, <laughs> I kind of enjoy, I kind of enjoy that. <laughs> but yeah, he was a weirdo in a, in a really, yeah, gripping sort of way, I guess. Uh, well, unless the audience has other super burning questions, I don't want to keep us because these sitting in front of screens business can get strangely tiring. <laughs> so I want I'll to throw think. one thing out there yeah. uh, for anyone that's interested. That's again, uh, uh, aspiring to write. Um, there's a couple, I mean, maybe you guys have some of your thoughts to your favorites, but there's a couple of books that I share with uh, student book, students' book suggestions that I think that are, are usually unusually great at kind of helping you think through your narrative or your character. And I'll just throw out one um, about narrative, which is called Story by Robert McKee which uh, is ostensibly about screenwriting, but it's really about the structure of narrative uh, going back to um, Greek uh, theater and uh, really recommend it uh, from nonfiction to fiction that it kind of can help you structure. Super fascinating, thank you. Um, and I really, this has been a fantastic evening i've really enjoyed all of your insights and all of all of your readings and i you're this is it's been fun i've really enjoyed this um thinking about the connections between the way we work and how we work and all of that it's just it's and, and why and that's all it's all good um and i really would like to uh encourage the, the audience to look for books by these wonderful humans, both the ones that are out now and the ones that are upcoming. Several have been have been mentioned tonight. I'm very excited about that. And also some of the lovely things that have been have been brought up uh, as, as reading material. Um, and thank you also to the Grand Rapids Area Library for their partnership on this event. And a final thank you, of course, of course, to, to Brian, Sean, Sun Young, and Linda. And we've got a couple more Moving Words events yet in this month through November 17th. And so please follow us at thefriends.org. And we hope to see you again very soon. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you and good night. <laughs>